Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for organizing this conference, also this panel, and for having accepted our proposal. What we present today is a research project by Wojtek Agagatek, who will, give, who will be given the floor in a couple of seconds, and myself, entitled Never Waste a Good Crisis, Question Mark, Euro Party's Governance and Democracy in the EU. This is work in progress, and when I say work in progress, I mean work in progress. So our apologies for the fact that we didn't submit our paper yet, but positively speaking, we do not only say that we are open uh, to comments, we also mean it. So please give our suggestions to make our analysis uh, less descriptive, more in-depth, etc. What is this paper about? I think we are in the very heart of the topic of this process, of this conference, sorry, by linking the Euro financial and economic crisis with European democracy. And when we say democracy, we normally talk about party democracy. So quit parties, question mark. We started to do a comparative analysis of the three main Euro parties, European People's Party, Party of European Socialists, the ELDR, which recently changed its, its name into LDE Party, Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe Party. And we also think about including European Greens. We also compare over time. Since the Euro crisis has been lasting a couple of years, we start in 2009, immediately after the European elections until today, which uh, interestingly, from our point of view, includes two waves of party congresses. In their manifestos for the 2009 elections, the Euro parties did not include the Euro crisis because they had done their job too early, but they did so in the autumn of 2009. And again, all the three published documents in this autumn. So we are also able to compare the parties uh, over time. Our analysis is based on official party publications and semi-structured interviews with representatives of the party headquarters, their respective groups in the parliaments and a couple of MEPs. We focus trying to see what the responses of the Europe, Euro parties are on the programs, the way how they changed, adapted their organization as well as their strategies. Why should we bother? Why do we want to do research about the response of the Euro parties? We know the literature on Euro parties, which says that we see a gradual, a slow but gradual evolution towards so-called real parties, fully fledged parties. At the same time, we know that these Euro parties are themselves demanding for greater influence in the European polity. And we also see that they are quite successful in adapting themselves towards new circumstances. When the European Council becomes more important, also their party bodies who cover the European Council become more important. We know that as far as the Treaty of Lisbon is, is concerned, which came into force in the beginning of the same period, uh, we are researching. We know that as far as party politics is concerned, the Treaty of Lisbon is nothing more than a mere formalization of what was already in place, but the direction towards more politicization in the EU is clear and adopted by the treaty. But what about the Euro crisis? It's not anymore on the top of the agenda, but a couple of months ago, and specifically in the period in which we had to submit the paper proposal, there was a lot of talk about the fact that the Euro crisis was not only a financial and economic crisis, but also a crisis about European democracy. How democratic, how accountable are decisions being made in the framework of the Euro crisis? So if this is true, if this is also uh, a crisis of European democracy, then perhaps it is for the Euro parties also a window of opportunity to strengthen their position. In other words, are Euro parties able or have they been able so far to profit from this crisis? Thank you. Now, we thought about three issues that we should analyze in this paper, namely programmatic response, strategic response of the Euro parties, and uh, organizational response, namely how parties change the organization to address issues out of the crisis. Now, why this is important? Now, some of you might not be pretty familiar with the literature on Euro parties, so let me just tell you two points, two challenges that Euro parties has been facing since the very beginning of their existence, since the beginning of the history. The first challenge was that they have been often accused 
that their programmatic documents are based on the lowest common denominator, meaning that they have so many national political parties that it's so difficult to come up with a really, I would say, um, tentative, some, some proposal, concrete proposals that everything they produced is based on common lowest, on lowest common denominator. And the second point has become more apparent recently. Namely, for a number of years, and this was tra a tradition, I think, started already uh, in the 80s or even earlier in the European Parliament, there was a coalition, a grand coalition of the three main parties at the European level, so EPP, Christian Democrats, PS Socialists, and liberals, now called ALDE, against all the Eurosceptics. So everybody who was trying to, uh, I would say, object to the very idea of the European project. And at this moment of the crisis, and this is the first conclusion of our tentative conclusion of our project here, some Euro parties, notably part of European Socialists, have noted that this is no longer possible. That the strategy where the mainstream parties build a bloc, pro-European bloc, against all Eurosceptics from the right or from the left is no longer possible to be maintained because the voters will simply vote for this populist and anti-European party. So what is needed, they thought, we need to politicize the European debate at the European level. In other words, we need to show that we are really different, that PS is different in its policy proposals from the EPP. And here we've got a few examples. Now, I, I've, as I said, given the very light hour of our proceedings, I thought that instead of presenting you some dense description or qualitative or quantitative of the programmatic offer, I would like to focus just a few keywords, highlights of what they were proposing. Now, EPP is in a strange position because it, has, it is represented by the majority of the uh, member states of the European Union. It has, at this moment, about 15, 14 prime ministers. So it's a very useful way to influence, very, I would say, a big opportunity to influence the European affairs. But on the other hand, this is also a blocking mechanism because they are simply limited. The room for maneuver of the EPP is lower than of the other parties because, as I said, they are represented by the prime ministers who have their own obligations. So we see that the innovation, level of innovation of the EPP is rather moderate. And we believe, we explain it in the paper, that this is due to the fact that prime ministers have their own constraint and they are simply interested to uh, keep what is now on the mainstream agenda. Although they try to do many things as far congresses are concerned and policy production. But we believe the EPP is rather moderate, is not so much interested in developing innovative policy proposals, but rather to maintain what their prime ministers are claiming. A very different situation concerns the PES, because the PES came to conclusion that the only way for them to recover, to regain the majority in the European Parliament and to become more important at the EU level is simply to show that they have alternative vision of Europe, that Europe should not be criticized as such, people should not blame Brussels, but they should blame a particular vision of Brussels and particular practice of making politics, which in their opinion is carried out by the EPP. And let me just give you a few examples of what they are proposing. So for the few years, they have been proposing financial transaction tax. Now it's becoming some member states are trying to develop and implement this policy. But a few years ago, this was really not a dogma. Nobody was really talking about this except for them, at least at the European level. Another idea they've got is so-called youth guarantee, which is a, a fund they want to uh, develop at the EU level, which would help uh, young people who are looking for jobs to survive this very first year just after they graduate. They are in favor of the Eurobonds from the very beginning. And important thing, they want to create a European rating agency because they believe that the power of the American rating agencies have grown too large, that this is too impossible for, for the European politicians to control them simply because they can influence the way how the economies are perceived. Now, with the liberals, it's a difficult situation because they try to defend themselves from those accusations that were quite visible at the very beginning of the crisis, namely that socialists and some other people were saying that this was a crisis of liberalism as ideology. So they were trying to put, use it and say, it's not a crisis of liberalism, it's a crisis of the markets, of the bankers, and of the Americans, basically. And right now, they moved to, I would say, more, I would say, even revolutionary uh, proposals in which they believe that any economic measures must be complemented by building a federal political union. And here, 
Guy Verhofstadt is, I think, the key uh, speaker on this in his post-nationalist approach towards the European integration in building a political union. So this is the first idea of programmatic response. In, a, in short, is there a one game only in the town? No. There's at least two games in the town. One is the one which is uh, carried out by the APP, another one criticized by the PS. So austerity only is not the answer, PS, PS is saying. Now, as far as the organizational response is concerned, here the Euro parties are continuing to carry out their previous activities. One of the most well known is the so called party summits, which they organize just before the usual European councils, just before the party summits, but which are limited to the prime ministers from the same party families. But what has been visible since the crisis emerged is that they also focus now on something different. So they went down one level and tried to organize, coordinate the activities of their ministers on the level of the sectoral councils. And we see, for example, that the EPP organized several ministerial meetings, in particular from ECOFIN, and also the PES is trying to intensify this debate. So, for example, your Employment and Social Affairs Council is meeting very often and is representing only PS ministers who later on try to represent, try to present a unified approach to the other, other uh, countries and other parties. Other examples, a PS proposed started to gathering uh, signatures to submit a European Citizens Initiative on the financial transaction tax. It organized various public campaigns. Of course, nobody is really aware of them, but at least they try to do it. They try to build a profile. So not only to help their own member parties, but also to build a public profile. And they write a number, hundreds of various opens, open letters addressed to Barroso and to Van Rompuy. ALDE party, again, a different situation, primarily because it does not have so many ministers, so many prime ministers as the first two parties, as the EPP and PS. So it tries to coordinate uh, council uh, ministerial meetings, but I would say it's still rather limited. But what is apparent here is that demand for the coordination at the ministerial level does not come from the ALDE party headquarters, but from the own member parties. So member parties of the ALDE party, of the member liberal parties from all over Europe, noticed the added value of the ALDE in trying to coordinate this sectoral council. And the last point is, I think, uh, pretty much the most important is the strategic response. In other words, how parties position themselves in the European party spectrum, particularly against EU institutions and against themselves. And here we see quite a new development, which is visible, I think, since 2008, so around when the crisis emerged, in which we have a growing competition between the two major parties, between the EPP and the PS. Here, how it goes. So EPP normally supports those governments who are coming out of the EPP political family, but also it strongly supports Barroso and Van Rompuy as two representatives of the EPP member parties. But here, it's, it's not really innovative. It's just commenting and approving what the Commission was saying, what the, uh, Van Rompuy is proposing. So it's just, I think, accepting and supporting, but not really presenting innovative ideas. PS, in a different situation, it coined the slogan conservatives to describe its political opponents and accuse them for the lack of management of the crisis, lack of political leadership, lack of vision. So this language is very strong. And they are saying, for example, referring to the previous presentation, that the austerity is not the only game in the town, that we have alternative proposals for Europe. So see, it's not Brussels that is to be blamed, it's Barroso, Van Rompuy, and all the EPP parties that are should be blamed. Not Brussels, don't blame Brussels, they are saying. And ELDR, so now ALDE, again, try to build a middle ground between the EPP, who they believe favor all austerity only approaches and the PS who in their opinion is in favor of the older spending. So we've got those three responses. So first programmatic response, there is some variance and I think it's quite visible between the EPP and the PS. They present two different visions of how to solve the crisis. Then we've got some organizational responses, in particular coordination of the council meetings. And third, we've got a growing level of politicization of the European integration in a sense of the growing competition between the EPP and the PS. So to conclude, three points, then also three questions to really finish this presentation. 
we see that the responses of the Euro parties, of course, first of all, deal with external goals, policy problems, perhaps polity problems at the EU level, but it also serves internal party goals. They use or are able to use the, the Euro parties, the Euro crisis, I'm sorry, uh, for strengthening their own position to a limited degree. In that way, we can speak of a so-called instrumentalization of the crisis. Euro parties supply something for which there is a demand as far as the member parties is concerned. Member parties in government are in favor, otherwise they would not send their representatives or they would not show up in favor of more intensive coordination, for instance, in the run-up to sectoral councils of the European Council, while parties in, in opposition, as far uh, particularly the PES, are also in demand of um, more initiatives in terms of coordination to formulate alternatives at European level, which might also be profitable. Variation in attitude, proactive versus reactive, confirmation what is at stake, what's on the agenda, or presenting an alternative, resembles very largely whether the parties, Euro parties as well as national member parties, are in government or in opposition. Although we might be believers of Euro parties and Euro party democracy, we should first of all ask ourselves when finishing this, re this re research, if indeed stronger Euro parties, does it automatically mean strengthening Euro democracy? Question mark. At the same time, we also see, this is also a kind of a puzzle in which we end up, that Euro parties, despite the Euro crisis, seem to be the first victims of what we call institutional fatigue. There might be a new treaty, there might be a new convention, there might be a political union, but so far it has remained vague and it is still rather vague, without a calendar, without who will be in, who will be out. Although we know from previous steps in their development that there, will, there would be among the benefiters of institutional changes, because it might be an opportunity to give them a bit more freedom and to get rid of a certain number of legal and political boundaries in which they have to operate right now. For instance, direct election of the European Commission president or indirect through the parliament, all these different kind of steps might be in favor of the development of the Euro parties, but so far they are not on the agenda yet. So in that way we conclude uh, that Euro parties are a bit victim of this so-called fatigue and vagueness of political union so far. We should also ask our questions, of course, would change adapt adaptation, what we have seen developing in the last couple of years in the Euro parties wouldn't have taken place anyway. So what is the causal effect of the Euro crisis? For instance, uh, if we look at the PS and how um, firm they already are in trying to prepare themselves for 2014 and probably presenting um, Schulz as their candidate for the European Commission, which might again be seen as a sign in further politicization of European election campaigns, etc. Et things we all know, this probably would have happened anyway. Uh, so this is not due to the Euro crisis. Although we try to, it's a different, difficult exercise apparently, we try also to assess uh, or to answer the question what precisely has the Euro crisis caused in the attitude, in the behavior, in the development of the Euro parties. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, thank you very much, Reuters.